Welcome to the Book Club interview. My name is Scott Hollister, your host. Today's guest is George Antone. He wrote The Wealthy Code. This is the Book Club interview with George. He is the author of three best selling books, is a thought leader in the investing and finance space, and an award winning speaker. George founded the world's largest network of private money lenders and is currently the founder of Finance LLC, a company that challenges everything we know about personal finance and investing and works to develop new and innovative strategies that help bring people closer to their financial goals and live more fulfilling lifestyles. So welcome to the show today, George. How you doing? Great, great. Thanks for having me, Scott. Really, really appreciate it. Very excited about this. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very excited. Like we were talking before earlier, um, I, I read a bunch of real estate books and finance books, but you really don't see a lot that just change your thinking, you know, just flip that, you know, 180. This is not what I've been taught in life. So I'm excited to dive into it. You know, I, I have to tell you something, so before, you know, with you saying that, I, I really appreciate it, but I have to tell you that the funniest thing, one day, um, uh, I was investing full time and one day I came back home and I told my wife something is wrong with me. I feel like writing because I've always hated writing and always hated English class <laughs> in college and school. And uh, I started writing thinking no one was, is ever going to read this. And <laughs> sure enough, you know, it sold like crazy. So um, thanks again for having me here. I'm always blown away that people have actually read the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's amazing to see. You know, it's, it's good yeah. to see people that, you know, don't necessarily like writing. Um, and, and, you know, you put it out there and you took a chance yep. and you're helping so many people's lives, but just, just putting it down on paper. So I'm thank yep. you. And I'm sure the listeners are saying thank you at the same time. So, all right. Yeah. So we're going to jump today into your first book, the wealthy code, what the wealthy know about money that most people will never know. So what was your goal for the readers of the wealthy code? You know, it, um, <clears throat> when I wrote the book, um, I had been, uh, you know, investing for quite a few years. And then one thing I realized with a lot of investors is that they were structuring deals incorrectly and they were uh, setting things up so that uh, they were doomed to fail. And uh, because one of the things I've learned is that buying the property or buying an asset is one thing, keeping it, especially through the, the downturn of, of real estate, is a whole different game. And that's really much more important because the buying part, once you've done it once, it's really straightforward. There's nothing complicated about it. It's really the second part um, of, of the, 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 the journey of the uh, investing that really becomes important. So one thing I found consistently is that most people had no clue about the second part. So I felt, you know, an obligation to share it. I had been sharing it with my, you know, my local uh, real estate club and friends and stuff. And a lot of people kept telling me, you have to share this with everyone. So really, that's why I put it together. And uh, it's been, you know, it's been, it's helped a lot of people. That's awesome. So where does the wealthy code fit into the big picture of investing? You know, that's a great question, too. Um, so typically, I, I tend to draw a triangle for people. And if you think of a triangle, and <clears throat> on one side, is capital, and that's all the capital you have to raise or have to buy. And on the other side of the triangle, on the right side is the asset. That's the asset you're buying. And in the bottom part is what's called capital structure. And capital structure, it happens to be the most important part of this whole thing. And yet it is the one thing that most people, most investors don't know how to do. And it is the reason most investors lose their shirt in investing. So wealthy code really fits into under the capital structure. So if you think about asset, for example, uh, a lot of people think of assets like, you know, whatever, apartment buildings, rental properties, notes, whatever they might be, these are the assets. On the left side, again, is the capital. That's the capital that, that you're bringing to the table or you're raising like a mortgage or seller financing or um, your own cash or whatever it is. Uh, but the capital structure is simply um, how you structure or how you, you finance the asset. It's simply in terms of debt and equity. And that, to me, the capital structure, the bottom of the triangle, is where most people are losing their shirts. Um, uh, so that's that's where Wealthy Court sort of fits in. 
Interesting. So, you know, what is the capital structure and why is it important to, you know, stack that correctly? That's another great, great question. So <clears throat> what I tell people is, again, capital structure is simply how much debt and how much equity you're structuring for the capital. For example, 80 percent versus 20 percent or 70 percent versus 30 percent equity. Uh, and uh, so it's really you have debt and you have equity and the combination is so critical. And here's why. So imagine three people buy, three friends buy properties right next to each other. The same rental property, the same rent, everything is the same, except they structure the capital differently. And um, uh, one person could lose the property to foreclosure uh, within two years. One person could, um, uh, you know, quit the real estate and say this doesn't work. And one person could excel and do incredibly well, all because of the capital structure. So, um, so that's why it's so important because it is not the property that actually generates problems for investors. It's really the capital structure. Um, it is not having the right debt or having the right um, uh, enough equity or whatever it is. So that combination is so critical and that's where most investors lack uh, um, experience. Interesting. So why is having debt important and how can debt backfire? That's a great question. <clears throat> so the so what most people should do is they have to realize that if you how should I say this in uh, so there is this concept of having too little debt, there is too much debt, and then there's the right amount. So let's talk about each one of those. So uh, a lot of people out there will tell you use as much debt as possible, hundred percent debt financing to buy properties. That is the worst, worst, worst information now i'm assuming buy and hold if you're buying it for rehab mm -hmm. that's the, okay for short term but if you're buying for buy and hold there's nothing worse than that um so having too much debt is is a problem having too little debt it's actually your um your so let me just tell you uh, let me say this so one of the things about debt is it allows you to leap forward financially in terms of purchasing power because one of the things about debt <clears throat> structured correctly, and we'll talk about how you structure that correctly here in a minute, but structured correctly, it allows you to pass the negative effect of inflation towards the lender. So I want to, I want to say that again, because that's huge. Mm. So if you think about if I, if I buy something, let's just say I buy a stock and I buy it with $10,000 with no, um, just, um, and I make whatever money amount, inflation is still working against me. Because now, uh, let's just say I, I, I made some money, but inflation worked against me. Now, with with debt, and I can go into the math behind this, um, with debt, you are shifting all the negative um, effects of inflation to the lender. And that is huge. That is huge because now you are, um, you are making the whole, you're turning the whole financial system it's wired to work against, I'm, I'm going into way too much detail here, but <laughs> it allows you to really improve your, what's called purchasing power significantly more than, um, more than other investments. So having debt is extremely important, but too much debt, it um, uh, sets you up for, for failure and too little debt also is, is not uh, allowing you to improve your purchasing power fast enough. So that's why you have to know how much debt you have to have and not too much and not too, not too little. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I'd love to expand on that. So let's say we're leveraging, you know, four to one. So putting 25% down or five to one, putting 20% down. So yeah. when you shift, you're saying you, you put that risk on the lender because they have more capital in the stack. Therefore, they're locked up more of their own and inflation's working against that. So, um, so this is getting into, uh, uh, so what I'm saying is the risk you're shifting. So how should I say this? Um, in terms of the, the, in terms of, let's talk about inflation first mm -hmm. inflation. Whenever I borrow money from someone, you're passing the negative effect of inflation to the, to the lender. Now the lender, meaning the banks are shifting it back to the deposit because they're borrowing the money themselves. 
Mm -hmm. So ultimately, the depositor in a bank um, is the one getting essentially screwed. Okay. So what happens is if I put 100% of the money cash, my own money into a deal, I have now inflation impacting 100% of my capital. But if I put 20% down, it's only impacting 20%, but I'm making money off of the 80% because I'm passing the, whenever you create arbitrage, whenever you create a spread, um, so for example, the rent's coming in and I'm paying the lender, I'm making a spread, which we'll, again, we can talk about what that means in terms of numbers. Um, you are passing all the negative effect of inflation towards the lender on that 80%. So in other words, you are, whenever you, you create a spread, you are netting, you only have to pay, uh, in this case, um, uh, uh, you know, on the taxes and stuff. But in terms of purchasing power, you're improving your purchasing power. Now, in terms of risk, it's different. Anytime you take on debt, you take on more risk. So the question is, how much risk are you comfortable with? Uh, because having too little is, um, having too little, you're, you're so uh, I should be, ask me about the break even later, and you'll see why I'm, I'm hesitating, because there's a formula that, that impacts all of us as investors, and most people don't know it exists. So that's why I'm hesitating, because when, whenever I go into that formula, it explains what my hesitation with uh, with that. But we essentially need uh, debt to be able to um, uh, create. So in the beginning of your journey uh, as, a, as an investor, you want to maximize debt without having too much. So there's a, there's a ratio that I use that we all should be using called debt to asset ratio. And debt to asset ratio is the total debt you have divided by the total assets you have, including cash. That number altogether for investors should be, that's essentially how fast you're driving the car, okay? So um, uh, every investor should be calculating that for all their whole portfolio, it's one number. So that number should be no more than 65%. So that's when you're driving fast and it should be no less than 25% when you retire, okay? So what happens is most people have no clue this exists, but you should be looking at your debt to asset as an investor because when the market starts going down, up and down, you have to know how to adjust that ratio because it affects all your investments. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, yeah, and then we can dive into more uh, numbers here, but uh, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, and that's interesting. I love I love that deep dive into the, the ratio <laughs> numbers and and think of the big macro picture. Um, mm -hmm. So before we get it, you know too deep into that, so let's go back to the basics. So so what are some of the mistakes that new investors make? So um, th they focus so much on on the asset, and they think the asset is going to make them rich. So let's go back to the triangle. The triangle says there's capital, there's asset, and there's capital structure. So they're so focused on the capital, I mean, on the, sorry, on the uh, asset, they think the asset, let's just say real estate, for example, is going to make me rich. But it's not the asset that actually makes you rich. It's actually the right capital structure. So all they do is they think, by me buying a property, I'm going to get rich, for example, over time. And that is not true. Um, it is the capital structure, the right capital structure that will make you rich. So uh, essentially what they do is they say, I'm going to go 100% debt financing. Here's an example of what they do is they say, I'm going to get a 15% uh, 15 year loan. I'm going to for a down payment, I'm going to use a credit card or I'm going to use a HELOC from somewhere else. And I'm going to borrow money from friends and family and they buy the property. And now they're sitting on this, they're, they have this rental property, but they don't realize that everything they structured is incorrect. And all it takes is one bump in the, in the market uh, and the market starts going down. Uh, that's where they're gonna get completely, completely screwed uh, because they thought it was the real estate that's gonna make them rich, but it is the capital structure, the right debt financing and the right equity financing that actually makes them rich. So that is one of the biggest mistakes. And then the second mistake that a lot of investors do is they're so focused on buying distressed properties that they think that's, <clears throat> they think it's a, just a matter of buying more distressed properties. The problem with that, I find, is they really should be focusing on 
building relationships with the right money partners, with the right people. Um, so it's completely other side of the spectrum. And so, for example, um, I have a lot of my students, I have them focusing so much on building relationships with the right people. Now they're able to manage you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars of other people's money. And what happened is they can buy properties, just even buy and hold at retail, but they end up making so much more money uh, because they're able to deploy more money. On the other hand, I see a lot of people that are doing distressed properties and they're happy they made 20,000 or 30,000 on a deal, but how many deals are they able to do? So they're constantly focusing on the wrong side of the equation, which is on a distressed, distressed, distressed asset, right? But mm -hmm. if you focus on the other side, let me manage. So if you look at Wall Street, they make money managing other people's money, okay? So if you focus on the money side, right, and put them in the right low risk assets, um, that's where you make a lot more money. So, um, so these are some of the mistakes I find a lot of uh, students, uh, a lot of um, sorry, new, new investors doing. Mm -hmm. We hear it all the time. You know, you, you buy the real estate, buy the real estate, and and yeah. the mindset shift is, you know, controlling the asset and and sure. knowing where to create the arbitrage and like sure. you said, managing the capital. Um, so I want to really dive into an example. So let's say you find a property, George. Can you walk mm -hmm. me through the exact steps to structure the capital for that deal to maximize safety and return for investors? Okay, so so I'll, I'll give you a, a diagram uh, that I, I have all my students uh, go through. So, so there are really three main steps. Um, let me see if I have it here somewhere. Um, there are really three main steps. There's, you start with the, and each step has three steps uh, on its own sub steps. So the first thing is to identify the assets. So in, the, in, in the example you said, there's a property, right? Mm -hmm. Get the basic information such as expenses, um, you know, do your due diligence on the asset and all that stuff. And um, you get the basic in, uh, information such as what, what's the cap rate, what's all this stuff. And then what you do is you, you want to categorize the assets. So what I mean by that is if you go back to the triangle on the asset side, all assets, all assets fit into one of six buckets, okay? And for now, we can talk about that later, but for now, the property fits into the income and growth asset with under stable assets, okay? So we know what, which bucket it fits into. The bucket correlates with the right capital structure. So in step number one, we, we identify the property, we got all the basic information such as, um, you know, the expenses and cap rates and price and all that stuff. We categorize it. We know which category it is, so therefore we know which capital structure to do. Now, in the second phase, we look at how much debt can this asset handle. So here's where it's interesting. Every single asset can only carry so much debt. So think of debt as weight, right? You can only take so much weight, right? So once you figure out the maximum debt, Let's just say in our example, we calculate it to be 80%. So therefore, you have to fill the rest with equity. So you start by calculating how much debt can it afford, let's say 76% or 78%, whatever it ends up being. And there's a way to calculate that. And then you have to structure the right debt. Again, let's talk about structuring debt later correctly. Um, and then this next step is you set up the equity. The equity has to be equity financing. That means you either use your own money and or you bring in an equity investor who puts up the money and you share uh, a piece of the action, right? Mm -hmm. That's uh, equity. Finally, you have to have reserves. So now that you you know how much debt you have, let's just say in our example, 76%, and then you have 24% in equity financing, now you have to figure out how much reserves. Now here's the thing about reserves, most people think reserves is money sitting in a checking account doing nothing. That is the worst, worst, worst advice out there. It's almost like a, building a huge building with no foundation. So debt mm -hmm. requires foundation and the foundation is reserved. That's what holds the, the, the building, if you will, holds the, the, the debt. So you have to have enough reserves, three to six months of um, you know mortgage payments and expenses uh, at least. So that sets up uh, step number two, you have the right amount of debt, the right amount of equity, 
and the right amount of preserves. Now you go on to uh, step three in, in structuring this deal. Um, in step three, you're looking at, uh, do I have enough, uh, sh I should measure risk. So there's a diagram I have, um, uh, which we can talk about again later, but you have to measure risk. So most people don't measure risk. They look at the return and they say, hey, I'm gonna make 12% return. That looks fascinating. You know what, but what is the risk? What if the risk is significantly higher than that return? So you have to be able to measure risk. And so some of the metrics to, to measure return, are, I mean risk are uh, debt coverage ratio, DCR, um, break even, uh, there's you know reserves, there's how much debt you have, some of these things. Once you have measured risk, then you shift over to measure return. Is the return, does it make sense at this point uh, for you and for your investors? And then based on that, you can make a decision on that. So again, high level, find out the property, what are the numbers, how much debt can it uh, afford, put the rest as equity, then you put enough reserves, and then look at the risk, measure the risk based on the structure you have, and then look at um, the return and make a decision at that point. So that's how I go about doing the capital structure. Again, I'll give you a diagram that I, I have my students do. Um, for your listeners. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So let's um, move a little bit forward. So I, I want to talk about a, a topic that I haven't really seen in any other book, um, and that's called the loan constant, which equals the annual loan payment divided by the loan amount. So can you expand on that, please? Yeah, so... <clears throat> So here's the, the example I, I sometimes give is, uh, so the loan constant is whenever you're buying, buy and hold. Anything that has income, anything, any asset that has income, you have to measure what's called the loan constant and it is one of the most important metrics out there. So here's an example. Let's just say we have three people, okay? Um, one, and, and I wanna borrow, let's just say I'm gonna borrow $100,000 at 10% from each of those people. They all offer me the same loan, $100,000 at 10%. However, the first one says to me, uh, pay me $10,000 per year. That's 10% of 100,000, right? The second person says to me, pay me 24,000 a year because um, I want you to pay me 10% interest, but I want you to pay me additional principal so you can pay, me the pay off the loan in four or five years, okay? The third person says, you know what, pay me $1,000 a year and any unpaid interest just add it to the loan amount, okay? So now we have all three loans, 100,000, we have 10% across the board, but everyone has a different payment structure, okay? Now, it turns out that the best loan for this, well, let me ask you, which one do you think is the best loan for us as a borrower? I'd, I'd probably go the 100k at the 10k at the end of the year but you, okay. you, you trump me in the book so I don't know <laughs> yeah. so so here's what's interesting is let's look at the first one the first one says you pay me 10 uh, 10,000 every year that's 10 percent of hundred thousand now can we pay this person more if we choose to the answer is obviously yes we can right um, so we have the choice of paying him 12,000, 15,000, but as long as it's 10,000 is the minimum payment. Now, the person in the middle said to us, 100,000, 10%, but pay me 24,000 a year. Now, that's a big payment. So, if we lose our job and we don't have enough money coming in and we lose a tenant, for example, do we have a high payment? The answer is yes. Can we do we have the choice of, you know, paying less if we if we choose? The answer is no. We it's a high payment. And that's a high risk. We could lose the, pro the, the asset in that case. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the third person. The third person says, you can pay me $1,000 a year, not a month, a year. And obviously we have the choice of paying more if we're doing good. So if everything is going well, we have a tenant and we have a job and everything's going well, we can always pay 2,000, 10,000, 24,000 a year. We have a lot of choice. The other one, we have a high obligation. The second one, we have a high obligation with not much choice. With the third one, we have the most choice and a very small obligation. So mm -hmm. it turns out that the last one is actually the best loan for us because if we lose our job and things go south, 
we can always go down to the $1,000 payment per year, right? So it gives us the most flexibility. So it turns out, even though they're all the same interest rate, 10%, the same loan amount, what is the metric that allows us to measure the annual payment? So there is no, um, uh, so most people don't think about that. So it turns out the loan constant is that metric. So let's go back to these numbers. $10,000 divided by 100,000 is a 10% loan constant. The second one is a $24,000 per year divided by 100,000 is 24% loan constant. And the last one is a 1,000 divided by 100,000. That's a 1% loan constant. In other words, loan constant is a measure of flexibility. The lower the number, the more flexibility we have and the more cash we make, right? But, and, and also it's a measure of risk. So the higher the loan constant, the higher the obligation, the higher the risk. So most people don't talk about loan constant, but loan constant, even though the interest rate might be the same on all three loans, the loan constant is clearly different. And so when you start looking at that, you start realizing that we need the most flexibility. We need the lowest loan constant as investors because it gives us flexibility in case the market's going down, uh, we don't have, we, you know, something is going south, we have the most flexibility. So mm -hmm. that's what the loan constant is. And as investors, we have to be choosing the lowest loan constant, again, for buy and hold. This doesn't apply for rehabbing or flipping properties or whatever it is. It's strictly for buy and hold. Interesting. And and that was you talking about primary residence in the book and, and you had three different loans. And I think one was a 40 year, a 30 year and a 15 year. Um, mm -hmm. And it may have been a no, but there's a fourth one. And it was it was a HELOC, but it was like interest only for, for 15 Correct. years. And Correct. and that that threw me through loop because I was like, OK, I like the 30 year just in case and my mother you know taught me that she was a lender for a while and is just in case you can't make that 15 year principal and interest you're, you're stuck she's like but you can yep. always pay forward each month and that's what you were talking about but you actually you taught us that that 15 year interest was the best one because again it gave us that flexibility you could pay that payment per month and Correct. just in case something didn't happen you know you have that that maneuverability to make those payments and still keep your head above water that's correct and 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 just to be just to be specific that was an interest only and uh fixed i think it was a 10 year in the in the book i'm not sure but um the key there the other part of this um scott is is you're talking about the loan concept but also the the interest has to be fixed you don't want you want to try to avoid variable interest so going back to you know what you're saying in your example um uh, you want to avoid anything where the, the payments adjust because that's an unknown. That's um, so you really want to have the lowest loan constant with the with the fixed interest rate. So going back to your interest only, yeah. So that has to be interest only as well. Mm -hmm. so, that's amazing, and that's long term buy and hold. Correct. Correct. Yep. Awesome. And, now, and and I'll tell you what's interesting. Yeah. Sorry, just to to yeah. and if you look at what most investors were doing in two thousand seven, two thousand eight. The loan constants were extremely, extremely high um, uh, because they were getting the wrong, wrong loans, and uh, they had a lot of them had um, variable and things like this. So, mm -hmm. if you look at how to structure debt correctly, in every way they broke the rule, in every possible way. And um, uh, so, so one of the things we can expand on is loan constant needs to be compared to the cap rate of the building of the property. So what happens is the cap rate has to be higher than the loan constant. And the, the more the, the spread, the better. That's called the spread. Well, it turns out in 2007, a lot of investors had it the other way around, where the cap rate was lower than the loan constant. And so mm -hmm. then they're wondering, why am I losing my, my shirt? And they blame the economy. But guess what? As investors, you have to know what to do when the market's going down and when it's going up. And that's where this, this uh, capital structure comes in. And again, we can expand on that, but it's really important to understand that the loan constant has to be less than the cap rate on, on the asset. Interesting. And can you expand upon that 2007, 2008? It sounds like you've been around for, for a little while. And I think, you know, myself included, I didn't start investing until, you know, 2012. So post crash. Um, what was the important thing to learn? So was it that ratio of that cap rate and loan constant? 
and you know how do you how do you you know knowing you know arming yourself with this information now prepare yourself for another correction that's an excellent question so so let me cover two main things here <clears throat> the second thing i'll talk about is what to do when the market goes down you should know what to do as an investor so going into a deal you should know it's going to happen what to do uh, but the first thing is how do you structure the, the 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 capital structure or the debt specifically the correct way from the get-go okay so let's talk about that so from the get-go you want to have the lowest loan constant, like we talked about, again, loan constant is your annual payment divided by the loan amount. You want to have fixed interest rate and you want to have reserves. Okay. So by having, and you want to have the right amount of debt. So we talked about this. You, you have to make sure you don't go above, in our example, 80%. But in reality, you have to measure how much debt you, you can, the asset can, ha can handle. So for now, let's do 80%. Fixed interest rate, lowest loan constant, and enough reserves. Now, what happens, so that's the right structure. Now, for the down payment, avoid debt. I can't stress that enough. Avoid debt for long-term buy and hold. It has to be equity investing, either your cash and or um, uh, equity investors. Okay, meaning someone puts up the money and then you share with them on the upside and things like this. Now, having said that, when the market's when the market's going up, debt helps you. Debt is your your friend. But when debt, the market starts going down, debt becomes your enemy very very fast. Okay. So one of the things you have to learn to do when the market's going down is two things. There's actually more, but the two main things is you have to deleverage. And we'll talk about how you deleverage here in a minute, and increase your reserves. So think of it as taking a defensive position. You l increase your reserves and you deleverage. Deleverage simply means you lower the total amount of debt in your portfolio. So how do you do that? You could um, lower the amount of debt. That's one way, but it's not the best way. The other way is to actually buy income producing assets with little to no debt because that lowers mm -hmm. your overall debt in your portfolio. And that actually helps cover any any um, uh, hiccups in in your uh, in your uh, income and stuff like that. So the the big thing is to increase reserves. Now, when the market starts going back up, you can lower those and take a, a offensive position, if you will, and increase your debt overall. So um, does that make sense? Yeah, so that goes back to that ratio that you're talking about. You know, driving the car fast at 65. So let's say. Exactly. The economy is tanking, and that's when you're getting up to that 65%. Mm -hmm. So you're saying purchase with all cash assets, you know, r reduce that risk and liability, which brings right. you back down to that speed limit. Economy that's, gets good, then you can exactly add correct. some more debt. Okay, that's exactly correct. So you lower that debt to asset. That's that's a big aha right there for most investors. That debt to asset is a me measure of how fast you're driving. So imagine an accident on a freeway when you when you see an accident, everyone slows down to look at the accident, right? Yeah. And so same thing in, in the in the market. Market's going down, you lower you, you you slow down, you lower your debt to asset from whatever it is down to maybe fifty or forty five percent, depending on where you are right now. Um, mm -hmm. but you wanna take a defensive position and most of that should be in cash. You should take a cash position. Um, and then once things are doing well again, you speed up by leveraging back up. Interesting. Okay. And without getting, and this could be a, a super broad question, but what do you look for, you know, if we're talking buy and hold real estate um, in the economy to, to notice that, you know, debt to ratio, is it, is it properties that are pulling more capital reserves from us, therefore bringing up our you know, ratio to 65%? Uh, when buying properties? Yeah. I personally, I personally like, uh, I prefer um, uh, higher appreciating areas than cash. Because at some point, you have enough cash coming in, you, mm -hmm. you almost don't care because your lifestyle isn't going to change that much more. Um, mm -hmm. Whether you're making this much or this much, at some point, it's like, I don't care. I just want more appreciation. So because what happens is with appreciation, 
there's nothing holding it back. Like with cash flow, you have taxes, right? At some point, you have so much cash flow coming in uh, that you have higher tax brackets. You're like, ah, I don't want any more. I just want more appreciation because that can be turned into a cash flow in the future. So I, I've got to a point where I really care more about appreciation because uh, I have enough cash flow to, to cover anything and enough reserves. So um, I'm more right now in the position of um, appreciation. Having said that, I do tell people that are beginning, you really want both, mm -hmm. but know that in the long run, appreciation is going to put more money in your pocket uh, because there's nothing like taxes holding it back while it's growing. Interesting. Yeah, I love that, though. That's that that's that end of the investing journey where you take that different approach. Right. You know, right. you, you want to grow your capital, you be aggressive when you're a little bit younger. But, you know, that interesting. I love how you say appreciation because you, you hear appreciation. You hear sometimes it's a gamble. Sometimes it's not. But I love I think you used in the book uh, in California, for an example. Right. Over the last 20, 25 years, you've had you know, six to nine percent appreciation, which is growing tax free. And yep. you can exchange that later on. That's exactly correct. And 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 I'll tell you a lot of people here have made so much money in appreciation in these highly appreciating areas that they tend to forget that that's how they made the money because they want to buy cash flow after and that's mm -hmm. fine. But um, uh, people tend to forget that that's how uh, a lot of people have made money over time is through the appreciation. Um, now, again, I'm not saying you should buy only appreciation. You should buy both. Uh, mm -hmm. Knowing, though, you know, for cash flow and for appreciation, knowing, though, in the long term, long run, it's appreciation that's going to make you more money. But cash flow right now pays for the bills and things like this. Yeah. No, it's very smart that you said cash flow and appreciation. Yeah. So over the years of investing, so what have been some of your favorite investments to create that arbitrage? <clears throat> some of my there's so many um so I'll, I'll tell you for arbitrage um so lending is one of those uh, and, and honest just mm -hmm. rental properties but um uh, the reason i like lending and i have for in you know, many years mm -hmm. is because lending takes on a lower risk position and you can create wider spreads than real estate however it doesn't have appreciation. So you, in order to have a balanced portfolio, meaning having growth and income, you really want to have different investments. But uh, lending to me has always been fascinating uh, because it's a low risk, um, wider spreads. And um, uh, if you know what you're doing, you can do some amazing things with that. Uh, but you also have to balance it with something that appreciates over time as well. Interesting. So before we wrap things up, and I know we have a part two about the Bankers Code. So what are some questions that I should be asking you next? So, you know, what, one thing I'll tell people is um, uh, for capital structures is there are mm -hmm. three main variables for every single deal you do. So what I want people to think about is when I first started with real estate, I, I used to think about the, the walls, the, the light, the renter, the... The, and I used to think that's real estate investing. But the big thing that I didn't realize uh, until later is that real estate is just a game of finance, a financing game. What that means is if you think about the, the, the movie Matrix, and you know, in the Matrix, uh, he starts seeing the green stuff I don't know, towards the end mm -hmm. of the movie, the first one, and he sees the, the, you know, the binaries or whatever. So same thing in, real, in, in investing. You, you should see... There are three variables you're looking for. The first variable is, and there are, and these three affect all investments. It doesn't doesn't have to be real estate as well. How much leverage as a percentage? How much leverage to the asset? So let's just, in our terms, we, we would call it LTV, right? How much leverage? How much is the spread on every deal? The cap rate and the loan constant, and how much reserves? Once you understand these three variables. You can look at any deal and you can structure it in very creative ways. But it is that's what it boils down to. That's why real estate works so well is because these three work so well, these three variables. So a lot of people call themselves real estate investor 
and the problem I've had with it is now you are attaching yourself to real estate. You're saying I'm a real estate investor, but it's not the real estate that's making you, it's the financing. So now I stopped calling myself real estate investor because I can recreate that same thing with paper and different things. So if you think about real estate, there's two pieces of it, growth and income. Obviously there's more like tax benefits and all that, but at, at the end of the day, you have growth and income. Well, what if you separate them, those two things, and you have one asset here that does income and it does it better than real estate, and you have something that, growth, that has growth here that does it better than real estate. Again, you can separate these things and put them in your filing cabinet and realize I'm, I'm mimicking real estate. So I'm not saying <clears throat> don't do real estate. Real estate has some amazing things. Just realize the minute you call yourself a real estate investor, you are attaching yourself to the asset, but it's not the asset that makes you money. It is the financing, the correct financing that makes you money. So I tell people, start calling yourself, I call myself a finance hacker because we are looking at the financing part and we're asking mm -hmm. ourselves, what asset can we uh, encumber to allow us to do this thing? Does that make sense? Yes. So we're not attached to the asset. So that's what I tell people is to really think about those three variables and ask yourself, the more you understand those three variables, the more you understand how to structure any deal, any capital, any deal with um, um, uh, not just real estate. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> well, that's amazing. I mean, I'm going to repeat what I said earlier, the banker's code. I, and you gave the example of, you know, the Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad book. And as I was reading the book, I was like, this, this feels kind of like that because there was one point in that book, where it was like, a, it was an aha moment, right? Where it, it changed your mind where you gave two examples and, and we'll get into details here, but it, it's that same moment where you're like, well, you could separate those two, you could mimic and you could put that one on your shelf and it, it's giving you the same return, if not better. So, yeah. Yep. And, and one thing I'll say about, you know, Robert Kiyosaki's books, the more I understood and I studied finance, the more I studied investing, the more I studied, uh, you know, how these things work, the more I appreciate his work because there is so much he talks about that is um, you have to sort of read between the lines that are fascinating. And I love the fact that he builds this context for, for people, but it is um, once you understand, most people read his books and they look at it at face value. They're like, okay, leverage, you know, this, this, but there's so much behind and my background is in numbers, and, and I've worked on a number of uh, products uh, for Intuit, uh, Quicken and uh, Quicken Financial Planner and stuff as a developer. So numbers are very important to me, and I'm extremely skeptical. So I tend to analyze everything to death. But what happened, I, I really appreciated his books more and more because they're so much, they're filled with so much wisdom. And, uh, but people just read it at face value. So I, I highly recommend for people to try to think through what he's saying because there's so much, so much, so much there. Interesting. No, I love that. So, so the background, is that kind of where the love of, you know, numbers came from and the breed into finance? Absolutely. I, you know, I used to be in uh, software. And in fact, I used to work with my dad. Um, you know, he used to run a lot of businesses and, um, so I started early on with numbers. I've always been good with numbers. And then, uh, like I said, I, I when I worked at uh, Intuit, um, I discovered um, uh, on Quicken and Quicken Financial Planner. And over there, we can just, when you're developing software like this, you have to make sure everything works so that you're using Excel, you're using math, you're using all this stuff to prove the numbers work. And uh, uh, we can expand on that in part two of, of, the, of this call. But um, I discovered some formulas that affect all of us that, that most of us don't realize exist. And the more you understand those, the more you realize how important it is to use debt uh, and debt uh, very strategically to, to improve our purchasing power. Um, uh, it's fascinating stuff. And, and that's how, yeah, that's how I, I, uh, I got more and more into finance. Uh, and I find it fascinating. And then in 2001, I walked away from career in software and I went full time into uh, investing and uh, you know owning apartment buildings and and private money lending and all that stuff and it mm -hmm. completely changed my life but um, it was uh, it was fascinating 
Uh, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, George, for for being on. You know, this episode we have part two coming up next. So you want to tell listeners where they can find out more about you? Yeah, uh, they can. Uh, you know, go to Amazon to check out the books, um, uh, mm-hmm. or they can go to my website, finance, which is spelled f y n a n c dot com. F y n a n c dot com. There is no e in the end, and uh, they can find out about some of the um, interesting things I've been working on. So. Great. Yeah, and I'll link those in the show notes. Well, thank you so much, George, for being on. Scott, thank you so much for ha- having me. Really, really appreciate it. Really enjoyed this. And that concludes our book club interview with author George Antone, who wrote The Wealthy Code, what the wealthy know about money that most people will never know. It's a simple and easy to understand book that walks you through advanced and powerful concepts that can help you become wealthy. It's a story of a very wealthy man who was George's mentor and he taught him the secrets to becoming wealthy. And in his story, he reveals the code the wealthy use and unveils the details of that code. It gives the readers the ability to understand wealth, to build wealth, and to ultimately become wealthy. Check out the show notes where you can pick up a copy today. And don't forget to hit subscribe on our iTunes account and like on Facebook so you can stay up to date to the authors we're interviewing. My name is Scott, your host, and we'll see you next time.